Hey guys, it's time to Nephis and Chill. As requested by a lot of people, I'm putting out ESO University's basic guide covering the new companion system coming out with the Blackwood Chapter or Update 30 in the Elder Scrolls Online. In this guide, we'll be covering everything from how to unlock your companions once you set foot in Blackwood to what exactly makes your companions tick in their relationships with you. At the end of the video, I'll also be going over three basic companion builds and setups for the three traditional rules of DPS, tank, and healer, primarily for normal base game veteran content and overland zones. If you'd like to read instead of watching or listening through this video, I've provided a written version of the guide, although without the builds, in the video description below. Timestamps are also present in the description below and in the video itself as well to help you navigate through the guide. Big thanks to the ESOU Patreon supporters on the screen for making this guide possible, and another big thanks to Loot Crate for sponsoring this video. If you're into gaming, anime, Marvel, Harry Potter, and yes, the Elder Scrolls universe, you can subscribe to get a physical Loot Crate that will contain pretty cool and surprising items like buoyant armature socks, ESO companion chains, and more delivered right to your door. Unlike crown crates, however, you have a 100% guaranteed chance of not getting a radiant mount. So use the link in the description below with the discount code NEFIS for 15% off of your loot crate subscription. So what are companions and what is their intended purpose in the Elder Scrolls Online? Well, the companion system arrives with update 30, otherwise known as the Blackwood Chapter. Companions are meant for players to transition into content and to be provided with self-confidence to eventually play with other players in much harder content. It's a very interesting social experiment that devs have put out, uh, but on a side note, it is a pretty neat system. New players may also intuitively learn from playing around with the companions in regards to perhaps skill rotations or the basics of gear, although there are some uh, differences in how player gear works up from companion gear. Solo players will also be provided with a nice option to complement their uh, open world build as well. Veteran players may also enjoy just the lore and simply adventuring with their companions in tow, or perhaps using them as handy tanks and base veteran content if they can't find tanks. Companions won't be as good as players or as smart as players as the developers don't want companions to entirely replace actual players. As proof of this, a companion that isn't a DPS spec does a rather minuscule percentage of a fully optimized DPS player in a veteran trial as seen on the screen. Companions didn't take up a player slot in groups, meaning a 12-man raid team of players need to consist of 6 players with 6 companions total if you want 6 players to use each of their companions. Or a 4-man group for dungeons needs to consist of 2 players with 2 companions and vice versa. Companions can break free into the basic core combat abilities such as blocking just like players. Where can you take these companions, however? Anywhere in PvE including 4-man dungeons and arenas and 12-man raids and trials. However, they are not allowed in solo arenas or PvP zones including Cyrodiil, Battlegrounds, and of course Imperial City. Companions cannot exactly fulfill mechanics. For example, in Ethereum Archive, they cannot stand on one of the 12 pads required to be pressed by a player character to advance through the next area, or go down into Portal in Veteran Cloudrest or Veteran Sunspire. Companions have health bars and can also die, but you can resurrect them with a soul gem. You can heal and shield your companions while also being able to direct their aggro like you can with other combat pets such as assorted pets. Next, we'll talk about how to unlock your companions once you get your hands on the Blackwood Chapter upgrade from Update 30 as of June 1st, 2021. Now, in order to unlock your companions, you need to actually find them in the zone of Blackwood. Uh, no further real-life purchase or in-game upgrade is needed beyond access to the Blackwood Chapter. And as seen on the uh, video, you can find uh, Bastion Halix southeast of Leowin at Deep Scorn Hollow, where you will need to rescue him and then unlock him as a companion through the initial quest. Similarly, you can find Miri Elendis in Blackwood, slightly northeast of Leowin at Doom Vault Vulpinaz, where outside you can run into her and help her rescue her fellow travelers to unlock her as a companion through the initial quest. Once you are done unlocking them as companions, you can summon them 
just like you summon your banker or merchant assistants. Companions can be summoned by quick slotting them or through the collections menu under the allies category. They are account wide once acquired through some steps in the Blackwood chapter, uh, and they are not under Crown Store as they do come with Blackwood. It's also something to note that uh, they seem to interact differently with different characters on your account. So, let's say you have a good relationship with uh, Miri on one character, it may not be so on a different character. As for how you actually interact with them and access their uh, skills, gear, and so forth, you can do so by talking to them and accessing the companion menu through their dialogue. With the release of Blackwood, these two companions, Bastion and Miri, will serve as a foundation for the high potential companion system. As you can see, their leveling progression is from level 1 to 20, which affects their combat prowess, uh, how many you know skills they've unlocked. You can also access they have, including uh, looking at their level, equipment, skills, and other things by, again, talking to them and going into the companion menu through the dialogue option. What's really cool about the companions is that they offer keepsakes, and uh, you get these companion keepsakes, such as Bastion's Julianus Medallion, by progressing through companion achievements and quests. You can unlock each companion's keepsake, which provides Bastion's and Miri's unique perks, even when you're not traveling with them. So Bastion's perk is Bastion's Insight. Potions looted from chests and monsters have a 30% chance to be improved by Bastion's Insight. And what this means is if you pick up what a lot of players refer to as trash potions, which just, you know, essence of stamina, just give stamina, Bastion has a chance to upgrade that to a potion that offers uh, not just stamina, but also things like uh, major brutality, so weapon damage. So it's a pretty neat uh, perk that Bastion has, and as for Miri's perk, uh, you have a 30% chance to provide additional loot from uh, chest and also uh, treasure map chest in overland zones, which is pretty nice, especially if you're gonna farm for specific uh, type uh, pieces of gear or gear sets. And again, you can progress to the point where you don't have to have them uh, summoned or com actually traveling with you to get these perks. So again, keepsakes are actually a pretty cool feature that the uh, companion system offers. In terms of gear, your companion's gear is companion specific. So you can find different companion gear pieces ranging from white to purple quality items in various locations throughout the world. Uh, for example, you can get a green companion restoration staff from a world boss or a blue uh, companion armor piece from a delve boss. Uh, and it doesn't seem like you can upgrade these gear pieces, so it's up to you to kind of hunt and find uh, different companion gear pieces in different qualities or traits or weights. Uh, companion gear doesn't have levels, enchantments, nor do they require repairing like player gear. However, just to start out, you can purchase basic white quality companion gear from NPC clothiers, blacksmiths, and woodworkers should you need gear. You also cannot wear your companion's gear, and you cannot give them your player gear. Unlike the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, you cannot also make your companions carry all of your stuff for you. You are, after all, each other's companions of an equal level. Uh, the companion's item category has also been added to the inventory UI with update 30. And there's also different types of companion gear we'll be talking about here. Note that you can actually mix and match different pieces of these gear pieces, uh, whether it's an aggressive helmet piece with a vigorous chest item piece, as these aren't really item sets, but simply item pieces that have different traits that buff specific aspects of a companion setup, whether it's more damage, more health, or more ultimate generation, and so forth. Similar to players, companions have access to uh, a one skill bar, three jewelry slots, seven armor slots. They also have access to their own companion versions of skill lines, which we'll also kind of examine, including weapon skills, armor skills, guild skills, and class type skills, along with at least one racial passive. Companions, however, cannot bar swap. As I mentioned, they only have one bar. There are a total of nine item traits or types for companion gear. Note that the value of traits will be doubled on two-handed weapons when compared to one-handed weapons just like player weapons. However, armor pieces like chest, leg, and head do not follow the player gear rule of increased trait effects such as infused. The nine traits are 
Aggressive, which increases your damage done by a certain percentage for your companion. Augmented, increases the duration of the companion buffs and debuffs by X percent. Bolstered, which reduces damage taken on your companion by X percent. Focused, which increases critical strike rating by X uh, amount, not percent, for your companion. Prolific, increases your ultimate generation on your companion by X percent. Quicken reduces the ability cooldowns of your companion by X percent. Shattering increases the penetration of your companion by X. <laughs> Soothing increases your healing done by X percent. And Vigorous increases the max health of your companion by X percent. In terms of companion's skill rotations, if you're wondering how it exactly works, your companion's DPS, tanking, or healing rotation is going to be based on the order of the skills arranged in their skill bar. That's exactly the same as a player's skill bar, except they'll be doing it in order. Some skills will also have prerequisites that need to be fulfilled, such as a companion being below a certain amount of health for them to use, like a heal. Uh, you can also manually use a companion's ultimate ability by pressing a key binding. On the mouse and keyboard, the default button is Y. Take note that every companion skill has a cooldown as opposed to a global uh, cooldown per cast for players. This will force you to think even more about what skills to slot for your companions uh, for different situations when going through their setups to complement yours. Companions' unique class skills are heavily inspired or drawn upon from player class skill lines, whether it's a Nightblade or a Dragon Knight for Miri and Bastion, respectively. Did you need something? We're going to be looking at Bastion Halix's class skills and racial passive. Uh, his one racial passive is Tough, which increases his max health by 3% and damage done by 3%, kind of making him kind of ideal for both tanking and DPSing, uh, one or the other, from what I've tested on the Blackwood PTS. Or, uh, PTS. His class skills include Ardent Warrior, Draconic Armor, Radiating Heart sort of similar to a player Dragon Knight's uh, class skills. His only ultimate available at the moment is Unleashed Rage under the Ardent Warrior skill tree. It basically builds up Rage, then unleashes it in a devastating explosion around them. I think we've kind of run into a lot of mini-bosses or bosses in dungeons or uh, overlaying content where we've seen this kind of ultimate or ability on uh, part of the NPC bosses. Uh, the explosion deals X flame damage to enemies and stuns them for 4 seconds while also releasing 4 lines of fire in a cross formation that deal an additional X flame damage to any enemy they hit. Just a side note that the uh, stun does not affect bosses. Crack Smash, and I would like to believe this is a sort of an inside uh, joke between devs. Uh, crack Smash is basically a uh, player's stone giant or stone fist. He hurls a chunk of rock at an enemy dealing an X amount of physical damage. In terms of the DPS output, I wasn't too impressed by the Crack Smash, but uh, that's, uh, I guess, up to you. Uh, Fiery Flail. Bastion Halix lashes an enemy with flame, dealing X flame damage and setting them off balance for 7 seconds. It's a pretty cool skill because the off balance, uh, once they implement more off balance uh, uh, you know, nodes in the Champion Point 2.0 system, or uh, maybe you're struggling with sustain and you have to heavy attack targets that are off balance. This is a pretty cool skill and I, I, I really enjoyed it, surprisingly. Uh, Scorching Strike. Bastion Halix slashes an enemy with flame, dealing X flame damage and additional uh, X flame damage over 8 seconds. So this is his damage over time. And I really like this skill too because it is a 16 second, or rather an 8 second cooldown um, in terms of uh, duration versus cooldown. So... It, by the by the time you you know put this in the first skill slot and he he's gone through it, the rest of his uh, skill bar in the rotation in order, uh, it should be roughly up by the time he's done. And uh, draconic armor, Drake's blood, Bastion Halix draws under draconic blood, healing for twenty five percent of their max health, and reducing their damage taken by twenty percent for eight seconds. This is I think sort of a must have for his uh, if you want to if you want to tank harder. Boss, boss fights, even in, you know, tr uh, normal trials, or even, I think, vet trials, this could potentially be the only thing that can keep him alive, um, as far as what I've uh, tested. Um, but yeah, it, it's a, it has a prerequisite. It's used when Bastion Halix is below 75% health, which is pretty neat. You don't want him to keep spamming it. 
uh, crushing claws. Now, Bastion Halix calls for Talons from the ground, which immobilizes enemies and deals X flame damage to them for four seconds. This is more of an AoE uh, ability. Um, and I think, again, it's going to be situational depending on what you want to tackle on. Do you want to tackle on a world boss without ads, or do you want to tackle on uh, normal dungeons? And that's going to be the deciding factor for uh, some of his uh, skill setups in terms of DPSing. Blazing Grasp, and this is probably a really cool one too. Bastion Halix launches a fiery chain to grasp and pull an enemy to them. This is only used when they're not CC'd and is further than 10 meters away. So if you're struggling, I guess, uh, to manage adds in a dungeon or you need, you know, help stacking them, yeah, I mean, Bastion's got you. <laughs> it has a cooldown of 8 seconds, which isn't too long considering um, that he has to go through some part of his rotation to get back to this, so. It's pretty cool. Radiating Heart, Kindle. Now, Bastion Halix, this is like the uh, Cauterize from the Dragon Knight player class skill line. Uh, Bastion Halix launches a Searing Fireball at themselves or an ally to Cauterize their wounds, healing for 7,800 health at base. And this is only used when Bastion Halix or an ally is below 75% health. And this is sort of the healing tree if you want to if you want to spec him as a healer. Um, I think for sure after the uh, last round of changes or updates or adjustments to the campaign system. The campaigns are a lot more reliable as a whole, uh, tanking, uh, tanking and uh, healing um, themselves and handling them even well, more than well. I think I think's better than some players uh, <laughs> at uh, tanking and holding aggro or even uh, healing players. So it's going to be pretty interesting to see how this all pans out. Basalt Barrier, Bastion Halix calls the Earth to their defense, granting a damage shield for them and their nearby allies that absorbs X damage for 6 seconds. While the damage shield holds, healing received is increased by 15%. This is a pretty big deal because uh, it's basically the uh, player version of Igneous Shields. You get more healing received and you also get a damage shield. I think this is going to be a pretty tough one to pass up on for those of you wanting to spec your companion as a, as a you know meat shield or a tank. Or some, something that holds the aggro of the world boss or uh, the dungeon boss while you kill it. Searing weapons. Bastion Halix charges their weapons and their allies' weapons with volcanic power, increasing their damage done with light and heavy attacks by 15% for 8 seconds. Um, this is a pretty interesting one because this is actually a unique buff. It's not uh, major brutality or major sorcery. It's just going to increase the damage of your light and heavy attacks by 15% for 8 seconds. And I think this is a really, really cool skill to complement player builds. So take that as you will. Alright, and now we're going to be looking at the class skills of Miri Alendis and kind of examining them as we did with Bastion. Uh, her only racial passive is Dynamic, which increases her damage done by 3% and healing done by 3%. Uh, this is sort of where, I guess, it diverges from Bastion, where he can be more of a meaty, meatier tank. Whereas uh, Miri, she does more healing, but also does the same amount of damage done at a base uh, compared to Bastion. Now, uh, Deadly Assassin is going to be her first skill line, or skill tree, and includes her only ultimate ability, which is Impeccable Shot. And we've seen this behavior or uh, skill on in a lot of content where, you know, the archer boss or archer mini boss or something is charging up a snipe or a shot and you have to interrupt it. And this is basically Miri's ultimate. Miri Elundis marks an enemy and exposes their weakness, causing them to take 20% more damage for 3 seconds. Now, take a note that this is 20% more damage uh, done on the enemy. It's a debuff that applies to all damage. So you're gonna, if she lines up her ult, and marks, it, marks them for 3 seconds, for that 3 seconds, you'll be doing 20% more damage to uh, to that boss or target, which is really cool. Again, this is also not a major or minor buff or debuff, um, and this allows you to stack up uh, you know, de devastating uh, rotation or burst combos. And while the enemy is exposed, they build up to a single killing shot, unleashing a massive bolt that deals um, X amount of physical damage that's Quite a bit bursty of an ult. And again, it's like Bastion Halix is a uh, ultimate cost. It's 200 ultimate. It's a second longer in terms of cast time. But you ideally, you want that cast time to be longer. But uh, 3 seconds, I guess, is enough. The range is 28 meters. And yeah. Uh, her The rest of her deadly assassin's skill tree is Shadow Slash. And Shadow Slash is basically the surprise attack for Miriam Lindas, and she slashes an enemy dealing X magic damage and setting them off balance for 7 seconds. So similar to Bastion's Flame Whip, uh, we see this off balance pl at play here. 
Uh, Warp Strike, she flashes through the shadows as her gap closer and then ambushes an enemy, dealing X magic damage. Uh, this could be particularly useful if you want to use her melee taunt with the Warp Strike, or if you just want to spec her to be a melee DPS. Uh, it's, an, it's, it's, it's a nice opener, although from what I've observed, it sometimes bugs out. Uh, Slayer's Blade, Miri Alendis, dressed a magic blade with lethal precision to finish off an enemy, dealing an X amount of magic damage. This is their execute, and this is a prerequisite right here. It's only used when the enemy is below 25% health. Unfortunately, unlike uh, Player's Impales or Killer's Blades, uh, it has a cooldown of 8 seconds. So you gotta kind of think about where you want to place this in the rotation, uh, probably towards the end or towards the beginning. Um... Now, Living Shade is her next skill line, and it's going to include Ghostly Evasion. And this is the uh, Phantasma Aura from Nightblades, uh, where she surrounds herself in the Phantasmic Aura, dodging the next attack made against them, while also reducing their damage taken by 20% for 8 seconds. And this is pretty cool. It's like a sort of a tank uh, or even, you know, damage uh, ability or DPS ability, excuse me, where you just... Uh, she just takes 20% less damage from anything. It's not like Blade Cloak or uh, the um, Major Evasion Source for Nightblades, right? It's 20% against anything for 8 seconds. It's, it's kind of strong from what I've tested, and it does make her a comparable tank to Bastion, although I think Bastion kind of wins out ahead with a bit more of a utility. Um, but yeah, this is pretty cool. It's only use it when she's below 75% health. Mask of Torment. Now, Mask of Torment, it's the Hysteria skill for Miri. Uh, she just, you know, CCs enemies for, and that CC lasts for 4 seconds, has a cooldown of 8 seconds. Twilight Mantle, uh, she basically heals herself for 25% of her max health, and becoming invisible for 3 seconds from, again, it's kind of a little bit less uh, than Bastion's uh, healing, because this, again, scales off her max health, and if you stack, uh, you know, health uh, companion gear pieces, uh, like Vigorous, excuse me. Uh, she still has a slightly less health than Bastion, so it's it's slightly less uh, better. <laughs> uh, Soul Thief skill line includes Life Absorption. Miria Lenda steals an enemy's life force, dealing X magic damage and healing themselves or an ally around them for X health. Uh, Blood Transfusion, basically it's only a heal ability, not just for herself, but also for a different player. This is like the healing tree. Um, it's a lot of health in uh, it's a relatively short amount of time, and the interesting thing about this skill is that the cooldown and duration match, so you could potentially, you could, you'll potentially always have this up, um, and there's no prerequisite here either, right? So she'll heal you, or, yeah, she, she'll heal you or someone else in your group every time this is up, so that's a pretty nice uh, thing for her to have in a in a, in a setup where it complements maybe you as a tank, or maybe you as a DPS who, you know, you're expecting to take a bit more damage in normal dungeons or so forth, or base veteran dungeons. Life Siphon. Miria Lendis siphons the vigor from the blood of enemies nearby, dealing X magic damage and healing themselves and their allies for X amount of health. So this is like sap essence. Um, but yeah, overall, uh, Bastion is more of a tanky DPS spec, while Miri is a bit more of a healing and uh, DPS spec, but they they can both do tanking as well or any role, so long as you uh, set up their you know bars in a, in a in a way that makes sense, and also set up set them up with gear that also makes sense in relation to what they you what what you want them to do. We're also going to take a quick look at the weapon skill lines, the armor skill lines, and the guild skill lines. And this is universal across both companions. It's not like the class skills where it's unique. So keep that in mind. So if you want your companion to use a, you know, two-handed, uh, two-hander, maw, greatsword, uh, or battle axe, you have access to staggering swing, which uh, is basically dizzying swing and stuns your target while dealing an X amount of physical damage. Uh, on the side note, it also knocks them back 4 meters, unlike uh, Dizzing Swing nowadays. Sunder, uh, Miria Lendis slices all enemies in front of them with a mining swing. This is Brawler, dealing X amount of physical damage and an additional X amount of physical damage over 8 seconds. That's a nice dot. Uh, Sever, she spins around and strikes an enemy down. And this is only used when the enemy is below 25% health. This is Executioner. 
uh, if you want your companion to use a two ranger as a as the main DPS output. In terms of the one handed shield skill line, this is gonna be mainly just for tanking, and provoke is uh, gonna be the companion's melee taunt. Uh, you know, they thrust their weapon with discipline precision at an enemy, dealing X amount of physical damage, and tying them for 15 seconds. Uh, they have a cooldown of 12 seconds, so they're not going to be able to really spam taunts or try to get as many ads as possible. I think this is kind of be this is really good for like single target fights, but it can get it could potentially get a little dicey for some of you out there who are trying to solo or at least duo uh, your your base vet dungeons. Um, with your companion, but uh, as a pre as as a sort of neat side note, uh, it's used when the enemy is not already taunted, so that's going to be highly unlikely. Though, I mean, depending on the how many ads there are, <laughs> uh, where they will taunt everything. Uh, Bashing Bulwark has a cooldown of sixteen seconds. It's kind of their like gap closer with the one-handed shield uh, with a stun. Um, uh, it it kind of depends on what kind of fight you're in, but I haven't really gotten too much of a great usage from this. On guard, and this is the uh, defensive stance for from players for um, you know the companions, where they get a damage shield that absorbs up to 25% of their max health for six seconds, and uh, that's anything projectile, uh, direct damage, whatever. For the next skill line, we have dual wield swift assault. Um, this is Rapid Strikes. Companion floods an enemy with steel, battering them in five consecutive attacks at each deal X amount of physical damage. Spinning steel launches themselves in the lethal spin. This is a sp you know, spin to win. And of course, this is uh, there's no prerequisite for this one. So it's not really an execute or how players use it. But it does still deal triple damage to enemies below 25% health. It has a cooldown of 16 seconds, so that's going to be interesting. Uh, Razor Cape, she envelops them... Uh, they envelop themselves in a ring of floating razors, dealing X physical damage to nearby enemies every two seconds for eight seconds. Uh, it also shields them from their from attacks, reducing their damage taken by twenty percent. So potentially, if Bashan you know Bashan doesn't have ghostly evasion, um, that's something that people can consider. Bow skill line piercing arrow. Uh, this is a snipe, and this basically deals damage every eight seconds. Uh, trick shot. This is uh, acid spray. Fires a burst of arrows to pin enemies in front of them. It's an, it's basically a bombard, where they Im immobilize the as in front. So potentially pretty nice utility DP damage skill for a companion. Viper's bite. She shoots an arrow covered in bandari poison, similar to the poison injection tooltip, tool uh, dealing X poison damage and additional X poison damage over eight seconds. So that's a nice dot as well from the bow skill line. And we got the Destro Staff skill line, Destructive Blast. And each type of uh, staff, Inferno, you know, Frost, Lightning Staff, has a new effect or a different effect. Uh, all, sta all staves will blast an enemy with magic, dealing X amount of magic damage. But a Fire Staff will knock a target back, provided they're not an elite add or a boss. Back 8 meters and stun them for 2.5 seconds. Frost Blast taunts them for 15 seconds, so that's a potential uh, workaround for if you're not satisfied with the, uh, you know, cooldowns for one hand shield or even the undaunted taunt, well, which we'll explore here pretty soon. Uh, that's a, that's potentially another taunt you could use. Uh, shock Blast deals an additional 4,017 shock damage to all enemies around them. Uh, elemental Barricade, almost with Blockade, like player skill, uh, basically a wall in front of them, dealing X amount of magic damage over 8 seconds, and again, the duration and cooldown match. Arcane Nova, and it, this is Impulse, uh, she releases a surge of uh, magic to enemies around her, dealing X amount of magic damage. Fire Nova applies a Burning Status Effect, Frost Nova applies a Chill Status Effect, and Shock Nova applies the Concussion Status Effect. And I think depending on your setup, um, your DPS uh, setup could definitely benefit from either the the Chill Status Effect or the Concussion Status Effect, right? So for stand builds that, you know, won't have an Ice Step or someone to apply Minor Brittle, Right, because minor brittle comes from chill to give you that extra crit damage on target. You can potentially put frost nova on your companion, or if you want, uh, a, a, may, perhaps a um, somewhat not too high, obviously judging from the cooldown and the skill. Uh, if you want some minor vulnerability from concussion, then yeah, you'll go with concussion. I, I think fire nova is not that great. It's kind of underwhelming considering the companion uh, doesn't do too much damage on their own. I think the highest. 
uh, companion parts, quote unquote, I've seen is like uh, 8k or something on the world boss. And the rest of the staff skill line is going to be rejuvenation. Uh, starting with Reju rejuvenation, mending incantation, and Mr. Fortress. And rejuvenation is rapid radiating regeneration. Uh, just a nice heal over 8 seconds. That's a 4 second cooldown after its duration is over. Uh, mending incantation is basically combat prayer without, you know, the uh, minor berserk. However, the, the blessing that they slammed down also grants 7,000 spell and physical resistance for 8 seconds. This is pretty huge because like a lot of the uh, companion skills that we've seen so far, these are not classified as major or minor buffs or debuffs. So these, these will stack. So I think the rest of the staff is actually looking pretty strong here for those uh, you know, glass cannon builds that need that mitigation. I mean, 7,000 spell and physical resistance is not nothing to really laugh at. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, it has a cooldown of 8 seconds, if you want to compare the 8 second duration uh, in comparison to the 16 second cooldown. Uh, Mystic Fortress calls under st staff strength to protect themselves or the lowest health ally, granting a damage shield that absorbs 23,400 damage. That's basically a bar like a little barrier. But this is only used, however, when an ally or herself is below 25% health. And there, I, I think there will be some usage for this for a lot of specs on companions. But ideally, I think most players will not really want to uh, travel that dangerous line uh, over 25 or under 25%. In terms of armor skills and passives, you only have one skill and one passive for the companions. Pretty easy, pretty simplified, um, very uh, underwhelming compared to players, and I think that's kind of intended for newer players or less ex inexperienced players, uh, experienced players to kind of, you know, kind of delve into uh, while they also take care of themselves. So that's pretty cool. Uh, haste. Uh, this, of course, uh, just a heads up that each armor ability can only be used if your companion has at least five of the respective armor weight pieces equipped. So you need five light pieces equipped on your companion for them to be able to use haste, five medium armor pieces on your companion, for them to use vanish, and vice versa for the heavy. Uh, haste is basically going to reset the cooldown of all their other abilities outside of haste. Uh, otherwise, that'd be kind of OP. Uh, flow, the passive, increases healing done by 1% for each piece of light armor equipped. Uh, it also decreases the cost of break free um, for your companion per light, arm, light armor equipped. For medium armor and vanish, uh, they just basically go invisible <laughs> for uh, six seconds while they while they also heal the full health. So that's kind of neat. Uh, it's a 36 second cooldown though, um, and I think every yeah every armor ability has a 36 second cooldown for good reason. Um, and this is only used when she's below, or he or she is below 50% health. Uh, the medium armor passive is flexibility. Increases their damage done by 1% for each piece of medium armor. Decreases the cooldown of roll dodge by 5% for each piece of uh, medium armor equipped. Heavy armor, it's going to be Bork. Uh, they become an unstoppable defender, blocking and reflecting all attacks for 5 seconds. So they do block on their own outside of the skill, but... If you want them to block for a longer duration against a, uh, you know, a, a boss, um, then yeah, it's possible. Uh, this is only used when the companion is below 75% health and is fighting a difficult monster. I've actually tested this difficult monster part. It, it only seems to really um, consistently activate on bosses, whether it's a world boss, del boss, or yes, even a uh, normal vet dungeon boss or even a normal trial boss. So just keep that in mind. Firmness increases healing received by 1% for each piece of heavy armor equipped. Uh, the current bonus, of, uh, obviously, is 0% because she doesn't have any heavy armor. Uh, it also increases the amount of damage blocked by 1%, so, of course, this is kind of like, it all makes sense, right? Just like how um, the recent adjustments or changes, thematic changes to player armor skill lines and passives uh, were made in, in terms of, like, making sense. So, uh, again, this will kind of introduce newer players, I think, to that concept. Let's get talking about the guild skill lines, and uh, we're going to start with the Fire's Guild skill line. Sniping Silver, it's basically going to be Silver uh, Bolt, not Silver Leash, where they pull the enemy uh, to you. So it's going to just deal an X amount of physical damage while dealing double damage if their target is an undead, Daedra, or Werewolf. Ritual Salvation is a Circle Protection, lasts for 8 seconds. Uh, has a cooldown of 8 seconds essentially after duration. Uh, it puts a rune down, and if you stand within the rune, it reduces the damage 
both your both you and your companion take by 20% or anyone within that if you're in a group uh, with other players. If the attacker is an undead, daedra, or werewolf, the rune reduces damage taken by an additional 20%. And again, this isn't minor protection, like circle like the player's circle protection. So it can stack. So th this is really cool and really interesting how we continue to see this theme um, of buffs and debuffs not stacking, which I think we'll definitely see uh, practical application of. Biting Tramp, uh, she sets a sharpened blade trap in front of them, which takes one and a half seconds to arm, basically, you know, you know, the, <laughs> our uh, uh, trap, and t lasts for eight seconds. When an enemy triggers a trap, they're immobilized for four seconds. If the enemy is an undead daedra werewolf, they take an amount of physical damage. And this is, a, this, this seems a little wonky from what I've kind of tested, so hard to say if this is going to be actually useful in, or consistent, at least, in terms of uh, damage. For the Mage's Guild skill line, we got Starfall, and this is actually pretty crazy because they just call down the Meteor or Common. Uh, it's not an ultimate, it's just a skill, and it has an 8 second cooldown, and uh, it has a pretty far range, so you could potentially put this on a uh, range spec or DPS spec for Miri or whoever else. Um, deals X Flame damage and Reverse Entropy. This is kind of a play on uh, our player skill Entropy, right? Structure Entropy or Degeneration. Uh, instead of damaging, they actually heal us for uh, a good amount of health for every 8 seconds with a 4 second cooldown after the duration. Parallel, and this is really interesting too, particularly if you're going to try like ultimate generation builds. I mean, one thing I've kind of thought of is like, well, why not just have her try to spam this? And <laughs> you can also manually activate ultimates, as I mentioned before. So it, it's going to be pretty interesting to see what players can come up with with parallel. I mean, that's 50 ultimate every 16 seconds. So that's going to be pretty interesting. Uh, the Undaunted skill line includes uh, Crimson Font, which is basically Blood Altar. But unlike the player Blood Altar, the Companion's Blood Altar actually does actively heal you every second for 16 seconds. There is a pretty long cooldown. However, uh, it's a 20 second cooldown after duration. Um, but then you also do get access to a synergy for 16 seconds that heals you for 50% of your max health should you need them. So it's a pretty powerful skill, so I can see perhaps the reasoning as to why the cooldown is such, so long compared to the other ones. Savage Instinct, this is the range taunt for companions. Uh, this also provides a synergy, much like Inner, inner Fire. Um, and it deals X amount of magic damage and taunts the enemy for 15 seconds. However, the cooldown is uh, pretty long. Again, 36 seconds. I mean, compared to compared to provoke, it's uh, it's 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 a little it's a little too much, I think. But anyway, skeletal Aegis, This is a bone shield for players. Uh, companion surrounds himself with whirlwind of bones, granting a damage shield for 30 percent of their max health. I think I can see Bastion specs using this for six seconds while the damage shield holds an ally near them. And uh, you can activate the Bone Aegis, Syner Aegis Synergy, granting you a damage shield for 50% of your max health for 6 seconds. 50, yeah, I mean, again, long cooldown. But yeah, that's pretty much it. On a side note, uh, how do you level these skill lines? Well, it's pretty simple. Uh, these are pretty cool skills, right? So you want to level them up. Uh, if you want to level up the class skill, you just basically have to uh, basically just get XP and upgrade the combat prowess or combat level of your companion uh, and these will pretty much naturally rank up for weapon skill lines you need to just like how we do it as players you have to have them equip these specific weapons and then just kind of grind some xp the really cool thing about companions though it's not too grindy at all uh in terms of xp gain and we'll talk more about xp gain here pretty soon uh, in terms of light armor, of course, you need uh, you, the more light armor pieces you have, the more XP you'll get towards light armor and so forth with the other ones. Uh, the guild skill line leveling is actually pretty interesting, and I think probably the perhaps the most grindy aspect of the companion. Uh, it's basically just you need to uh, do daily quests, and I know a lot of people don't like doing the daily quests for the fires guild, mages guild, undaunted uh, guilds, but that's basically what you have to do to get access to uh, these skills. Other than that, you already will have the base passive uh, of the race or Dark Elf or Imperial, whatever Bastion is, and uh, you don't have to really do anything with that.
Now, one of the biggest concerns from players, since we're on the topic of XP gain or XP grinding for your companions is, uh, can companions negatively affect XP gain for players who are in groups? And this is, this is a very important question um, we asked the de develop developers. And no, companions will not negatively affect the XP gain for either you or people in your group, because this is how companion XP gain will work. For example, player A, you'll get 100 XP from killing a monster. And off of that 100 XP, player A's companion will gain one-fourth of their player's XP. In this case, it's 25 XP, because 25 is one-fourth of 100. So they don't steal your XP, much like how other players in the area can in increasing numbers. Instead, the companion's XP gain is based on your XP gain, which means you can stack XP buffs for yourself, so your companion levels faster. Although, again, like I said, the XP gain doesn't seem too grindy at all in the first place for companions. So I think I, I would fully expect, like, in the first week or so, a lot of people would actually have maxed out the combat level prowess. Particularly if there's, like, a, uh, uh, you know, more du uh, double XP events that we may not know about. In this part of the video, I want to talk about the rapport system. And companions have this rapport system or level or relationship level, which has a diverse range from having a huge disdain for you to really liking you. And I think there's potential here. I think that's set for potential like marriages or romance uh, interactions with your companions in the future. Uh, however, you can increase or decrease the rapport level by committing acts that goes against your companion's morality or character. For example, you know, Bastion. Uh, he's more of a noble character and won't like you pickpocketing people, but Miri here, she's a bit more roguish, kind of like a, uh, like a more tame version of Naryu, and she'll be fine with that. Uh, both companions will have their own dialogue options for their background quests or stories, uh, random quips as you adventure together and other neat features, so, uh, even during combat they'll say stuff, like, if I get heavy attack and I don't block it, uh, Bastion or Miri will be like, hey, whoa, watch out, right? <laughs> it's pretty, it's pretty cool. Um, however, note that you can actually adjust how much uh, your companions can talk, and it's under your settings and gameplay. And you can actually set them to like, you can just tell them to shut up, or you know, talk normally, or maybe you really like them, or you really just like hearing them, right? Uh, personally, yeah, I, normal is fine for me. Uh, now, the demeanor and how fast the companions uh, can temporarily desummon de themselves or leave will, or leave you will change based on your rapport level. So, let's say they really hate you. They'll just randomly go away. <laughs> and actually, if you have very low rapport with your uh, companions, they may also be unavailable to be summoned. So, there is a, quite a penalty to uh, you know having a really bad relationship with them, just like, you know... Now there's consequences for you having a bad relationship with someone in real life. Now we're going to be talking about what exactly makes uh, Miri or Bastion tick, or the basics, because not everything has been uh, found yet by myself or other content creators. So this is just going to be a basic list. So there may be more things that you know may piss your companions off, or uh, may uh, force, uh, not force, may, may make you uh, be more likable to them. So for example, Bastion, if you want to increase his rapport with you, uh, you just need to visit Ivea, read a book from a bookshelf, do a Mage's Guild daily quest, harvest a Sigic portal, scry for antiquities, visit Arteum, uh, and if you encounter, you know, bandits or cultists in those random overland encounters, uh, he also will s see an increase in his love for you. <laughs> and if he also killed a worm cultist at the beginning of a Dolmen event, he'll also start to like you even more. However, uh, what if you don't want him to like you, or what if you don't care? I guess, well, you can do the following. You can murder an innocent, friendly NPC, uh, use the Blade of Woe on an innocent or friendly NPC, uh, steal items, pickpocket NPCs, or even, like, you know, loot thieves' troves in, in Overland. Now let's talk about what makes Miri tick. Uh, Miri's rapport will increase should you do the following things such as visiting a daedric themed delve or public dungeon. If you do a Fighter's Guild daily quest, her rapport goes up. Uh, if you craft an alcoholic beverage, her uh, rapport with you goes up. If you also, just like Bastion, read a book from a bookshelf, she takes a liking to you as well, as she is a curious type. 
Uh, she also likes it when you excavate antiquities as opposed to scrying for them. Uh, she also likes the fact that you may steal drinking and scar scholarly uh, related treasures. Um, and she also likes it, it's kind of freaky, uh, when you kill goblins. And she also likes it when you kill large snakes. Uh, Lamia are not included. Um, and she will start hating you or disliking you more should you do the following things. Harvesting insects. She doesn't like the fact that, you know, squishing bugs is <laughs> a very immoral. Uh, killing an innocent or friendly NPC, just like Bashan. Using the Blade of Woe. Uh, key point there. Visiting the Dark Brotherhood Sanctuary in the Gold Coast. She doesn't like the Dark Brotherhood. And completing a Dark Brotherhood Sacrament with her active. She doesn't like that either. In terms of customization for your companion, they can wear anything outside the polymorphs. So anything you get from the Crown Store or the game in-game rewards, you can dress them up in. You can also visit an outfit station to, uh, again, dye things. Uh, you can also assign them specific mounts. So any this applies to any Crown Store mount or any uh, in-game mount that is rewarded, like the God Slayer mount. And when they do mount, they mount at the same time as you, and they can easily keep up with you while mounted. Although some limitations apply, like for example, uh, they listen to their mother when their mother asked them, "If you jumped off a bridge, would you too? If you if you if your friend jumped off a bridge, would you too?" Well, let's test this. No, she will not. So she won't. I mean, she calls your she calls herself your friend, but I mean, really. She doesn't really follow you uh, off the bridge. It's kind of mess up. But anyway, yeah, she uh, can follow you. She doesn't... She and Bashan don't really... The companions don't really like to swim, it seems. So there's that as well. Uh, as another note, they will also sneak. Should you go into stealth mode, and they'll automatically be in stealth mode. And if you want to sprint, they'll also sprint with you. And of course, just like house, other house guest NPCs, uh, you can put your companions in your houses. Uh, however, you can't really access their companion menu and assign them gear and stuff. An you can only just talk to them. And that's pretty much it as far as uh, companion customization goes in terms of outfitting, style, fashion, and housing. And now, as promised at the start of the video, I'll be sharing my three general setups for the traditional roles of tank, healer, and DPS for companions. And these are pretty general setups that I really like. And uh, of course, you can modify or swap out skills or even the gear trace themselves should you need to. But uh, this is what I've pretty much come up with after some hours of testing on PTS and comparing uh, the NPCs, and uh, rather the companions, and the damage. So, the first build I want to share with you is going to be Bastion's tank build. Uh, between Mary and Bastion, I, I found Bastion to be a bit more comfortable at tanking. Uh, on the screen, there's going to be uh, the skill bar, and of course, again, you can swap out certain skills uh, depending on the situation. Uh, for his gear, I really liked either 12 of his you know, gear pieces, including jewelry, to be vigorous, all to be heavy, or eight vigorous with four quickened, or bolstered, or augmented. And as you can see in this video, in Imperial City Prison, it held up pretty fairly well, although he may need some healing depending on how hard the boss hits, uh, or how frequently the boss hits in the Overfiend's example. Now, as for the healer build, I actually had the most fun with this one because uh, Miri has some interesting uh, abilities, or rather one specific ability I really liked, her ultimate that debuffs the enemy and allows him to take even more damage, and which stacks with your own uh, class debuffs or um, other effects. And I thought to myself, well, what if she can cast it as much as possible for me to maximize on that 3 second window? And also, what if she could also support me while I was fighting by myself? So, in a sense, that's why I went with uh, 12 pieces prolific. Uh, in this video, if you look at the bottom and check her ultimate game, it's insane. Uh, during trash, she was getting it literally every trash pack. Uh, during this boss fight, I have no idea how many times she got it, but you can see that's a very noticeable spike in 
um, burst damage when I release my bow proc and uh, with me timing with her and I think that was pretty cool the fact that I have to also play around uh, when she casts her ultimate on auto and uh, if I can it's, it's sort of like a little challenging mini game in, in a way if I can somehow get that burst window but yeah I mean the point of this build her build is to get the ultimate as fast as possible otherwise 7 prolific as well uh, sometimes 12 prolific seemed a little bit overkill but again the whole point of this as indicated by her skill bar setup is to get that ultimate while she heals and buffs uh, me and the group by min. So I really had a lot of fun with this and hopefully you guys will have fun with this as well in either overland content or in instance content such as shown here. Now for the DPS setups or build in general it was kind of it was kind of fuzzling uh, compared to tanking and healing which was a bit more straightforward. Uh, in terms of either a range spec or a melee spec for uh, companions damage setup, I really didn't quite like the melee setup because oftentimes a companion would die a lot. <laughs> I can't really sure it. Uh, whereas the ranged, uh, in the range setup for Bastion or Miri, whichever you decide to go with, I do recommend Bastion uh, since he does uh, seem to have an affinity with. Uh, certain uh, setups, including industrial stuff, uh, it, it was just a bit more consistent, as you can see in this video, right? I mean, if he was melee, he'd probably die to the, the jump smash by this boss. Um, but anyway, in terms of gear setup, I really couldn't pinpoint if the crit rating was really worth it. Uh, I don't think the crit rating is really worth it in terms of the gear trait. One, because of how the companion skill rotation works. Uh, you don't really have a consistent output of DPS or you know, damage casts. Uh, whereas aggressive in terms of a tr as, a, as a damage trait is a bit more consistent because, uh, I mean, most of the damage coming from the companion is in burst, whether it's in the form of a shooting star or something else. Um, and the reason why you want five light with two medium is with two medium you do a bit more damage, whereas five light you just want the access to the haste armor ability which will basically reset the cooldown of your abilities and uh, the Destro Staff along with your class abilities definitely can have uh, long cooldowns that interrupt your companion. Uh, in terms of skills, you can go with what I have on the screen uh, in the video. In terms of a, uh, you know, a medium or rather melee DPS setup for your companion, I would highly recommend 12 aggressive still with seven medium pieces because uh, it's just going to be, it's kind of similar to players, not in the sense of passes, but um, in terms of melee, I mean, if they're going to go in as a glass cannon, they might as well do as much damage as possible. Otherwise, you can try something uh, a bit more hybrid-like, because for sure, compared to player spell setups, companions do have more freedom. Uh, recommendations, I would say Duster Staff, 2 and Duel, the other weapon skills, I didn't like too much unless you want to try a uh, bow ranged build which is also a definitely more than a viable option for a companion dps but well if you've made it this far thank you so much for the you know viewing this and watching the guy i really hope you guys enjoyed it or got some nice information out of it i really do appreciate every one of you who do watch my videos and uh yeah i really do appreciate the support that you've shown in the past very hard year and hopefully with update 30, we all get to enjoy more of the companion action along with the other changes to the Elder Scrolls Online. Uh, it, again, if you want a written version, if you don't want to go back to the video or so forth, there is a written version linked in the description below. And if you're not yet in the ESO University Discord, we are almost to 15,000 uh, players that can engage and interact with you if you, should you need advice. Uh, also, we are still planning on finishing version 2 of the ESOU website, and I've been saying that for a while, and with that, I'll be making a lot of build videos, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Thanks for Nephis and Jilling. Have a great uh, rest of your day, week, how, whenever you may be watching this, and see you guys soon.